Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Welcome to worship, Forest Hills family and friends. Thank you for joining us today online, in your home, maybe even on vacation, but thank you for being here to worship our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, today we have several things to share about exciting opportunities that are going on in the life of the church, beginning in three weeks on August 23rd at 5.30 in the afternoon, we are gathering in the parking lot for an outdoor worship. So you're invited to come, bring a meal of your choice, uh, have worship with us, and enjoy a mission moment in the parking lot. We'll be socially distanced in our picnicking, and it'll be a wonderful opportunity to gather safely and worship our Lord. So again, that's in three weeks on August 23rd. In two weeks, on August 16th, will be our next, our next church business conference. We're doing it online with Zoom. So be paying attention to your email. We'll be sending out a registration email. You'll need to register in order to get the Zoom link to join the conference on August 16th at one o'clock in the afternoon. Now this week is a very special moment. A little bit later in the service, we'll have a recognition of the church's 75th anniversary. That's right, 75 years ago this week, I believe it was August 4th, we, uh, everyone gathered for the first time for Forest Hills Baptist Church, and Forest Hills Baptist Church was born when we started sharing about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and just spreading the gospel message right here on the corner of Dixie and Clark. Also, later today, we have the opportunity to celebrate our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through participating in communion. So now is a good time to go and grab the cup and the bread, grab your elements, come back, and join us in communion in just a few minutes. Thank you again. Welcome to worship.
Coming up this week, we'll be celebrating the 75th anniversary of Forest Hills Baptist Church. While we would have all would like to have celebrated this milestone event differently, we're not going to be able to. But sometime in the future, when it's safe and responsible to do so, we will, of course, come together and celebrate God's faithful to, faithfulness to us over the past 75 years. But for now, in this moment, let us celebrate a legacy of loving God, loving people, and living the gospel. As the Second World War came to a close and the sun began to rise on the American dream once again, a neighborhood full of young families and life began to blossom in Raleigh's western edge. As the suburb and her families grew, the community needed a place to break bread, raise children, care for the elderly, and worship with one another. So God called the church. The community needed the congregation bound by their Baptist identity, fueled by the Holy Spirit, and consumed with a missionary zeal to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the world. So God called the church. Ripe with youth and young ones, the neighborhood needed the family to bus in their college students, raise up their children, run programs, serve dinner, and to be the presence of Christ in the community and beyond. So God called the church. Called to go forth and bring God's redemption to the world, the church gathered in living rooms, parking lots, public schools, and under tents, as a congregation bound by the body and not a building. From a collar patch to a chapel, God's people built a congregation and a campus. They built a church. A church to serve the community and her needs, to serve families, their children, and their loved ones, to serve the broken, hungry, and the weak, to serve every nation, tongue, tribe, and race in Raleigh and around the world. Church, as we stand between one chapter and the next, worshiping with the joy and exaltation in the presence of God, the one who sees you, loves you, and has sent you. Know that your journey, this journey, has all been worth the while. For the countless families who have been loved, lifted up, and cared for. For the mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters who have survived hardship, temptation, and turmoil. For the communities near and far who have been helped by our mission and our love. For the house of worship we have built here together to raise up a generation that knows the same Lord who has led us here. Know that the God who has called you, loved you, and leads you proclaims, Well done, good and faithful servant. But a new day has dawned, and this community full of youth and young families have been overwhelmed by pandemic, division, and economic crisis. Perhaps, now more than ever, our community is in need. In need for a place to break bread, raise children, care for the elderly, and be in community with one another. So God has called the church. A congregation bound by our Baptist identity, fueled by the Holy Spirit, and consumed with a missionary zeal to proclaim the good news of the gospel to our community and around the world so that we may be the presence of Christ to our families, children, and loved ones. To serve the broken, hungry, and the weak, and to provide refuge, hospitality, and care to every nation, tongue, tribe, and race in Raleigh and around the world. For this, God has called the church. God has called Forest Hills. And God has called you. Will you join us in prayer? Lord, we come to this hour to sing songs of praise, to sing songs of thanksgiving and adoration to worship you, to confess our sins to you, to give thanks for the legacy of Forest Hills Baptist Church as we recognize its 75th anniversary. But above all, to proclaim the good news that you were in Christ reconciling all of creation to yourself and that we have been called to be instruments of your reconciliation and to be its message. Lord, many of us come to this hour with hearts filled with thanksgiving for the blessings that you have so lovingly bestowed on us. 
However, some of us come with heavy hearts of concern and care for friends and loved ones. Many, if not all of us, come to this moment weary from walking through the shadow of death that the coronavirus threat casts upon our nation. Whatever has brought us to this moment, we claim the promise of Scripture that you will send the Comforter and that you will be present with us and among us. We continue our prayer with our confession that we have committed acts of self-absorption and self-centeredness wherein we have pursued selfish desires, selfish ends and purposes. Forgive us for this. We confess also that we are guilty of sins of omission, wherein we have accepted your gift of salvation, but failed to be just toward others, to be kind to one another, and to be humble before you. We have also accepted your gift of grace, but failed to respond to your call to be in discipleship with Christ by living loving, caring, and other-centered lives. Forgive us for this. We also come before you to give thanks for your redemptive work and faithfulness throughout history. For it is through the revelation of your love for us in the lives of all who have gone before us that we have come to faith in the present. Specifically, we give thanks for the dedication and service of the previous and current ministers, lay leadership, and the congregations itself of Forest Hills Baptist Church. We are the grateful heirs of this wonderful legacy of our church and the community of faith that it has given to us and been faithfully sustained for these 75 years. May we be found just as faithful by those who follow. Finally, we acknowledge the evidence of your love for us that we have found in this community of faith, and we pray for and claim your promise to be present in this congregation so that we will have the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to sustain this legacy and bequeath the same to present and future generations. Go with us and guide us as we live into the future that you have planned for us. For we pray this in the name of the one whose name is above every name, Jesus our Christ. Amen. Amen. 
Our study of Romans brings us to Romans chapter 11 today. This chapter serves as the conclusion to a long argument that Paul began in chapter 9. Now in chapters 9 through 11, Paul was responding to the fact that Israel did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. He was in anguish that not all of his kinfolk had reached the same conclusion about Jesus as he had. He was especially concerned with those who had not heard the good news of Jesus Christ, and he was wondering who would help him spread the good news. Now this brings us to the beginning of chapter 11, and I'll read verses 1 and 2 and then 29 and third through 32. So let's listen now to these words of Scripture. I ask then, has God rejected His people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Amen. To say something is irrevocable is to say that something can't be changed or reversed. And we know there are some things in life that we can't change, but we wish we could. Take, for example, those moments in which we wish we could take back something we said. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's when we open our mouth and insert our foot. Well, sometimes our words do come out of our mouths faster than our brains are able to process them. The bad news is we can't take back what was said. All we can hope for is that other people will understand that we made a mistake. Now, I know from experience that it's never fun to fumble with my words in front of others. Way back when my wife Victoria and I were dating, she invited me to go on a ski trip with her mother Elaine. Now this was the first time I had spent any time with her mom. I wanted to make a good impression. I also wanted to enjoy some good skiing. And when you go skiing, you need decent ski clothing. Otherwise, you might turn into an icicle. And ski clothing, tends to be bulky, colorful, and sometimes flamboyant. Now back then I wore a wild looking toboggan that made it look like I had dreadlocks. And Elaine was wearing a fun looking hat and scarf of her own. Now I wanted to compliment her, but what came out of my mouth, and Victoria enjoys bringing this up whenever she wants to poke fun at me, is that I called her mom's outfit tacky. Now, I have no idea why I called it tacky, and I immediately wanted to press rewind and start the conversation over. But you can't take back the words you've spoken. Once they leave your mouth, they are irrevocable. That's the way it is with some things in this world. And yet more often than not, we're given a chance for a do-over. And this happens rather frequently. Just look at life in our country. We love second chances. Now, if you don't like something that you bought online or in the store, you can return it within 30 days and get your money back. If you don't like the food that you ordered in a restaurant, your waiter will bring you another entree at no extra cost. And if a coach doesn't like a call on the football field, he can throw his red flag and get a second opinion. Even bigger events in life are treated as reversible. If you don't like your name, you can have it legally changed. Or if you have taken on too much debt, it can be erased through bankruptcy. Now there are many different things in life that we can redo or even revoke, but it's impossible for us to revoke the gifts and the calling of God. Today's scripture makes it clear that God is a God of certain irrevocables. As Paul writes in verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. 
Now let's take some time to consider what this means. And let's start with the gifts of God. Now there are many gifts that I could talk about, but the one I want to focus on, and it's at the heart of our scripture passage, is God's mercy. It is irrevocable. Now God's gifts are different from blessings and that blessings change. They ebb and they flow. The Bible tells us that rains come and go, crops boom and bust, but the gift of God's mercy is constant. Now we know of this because God didn't reject Israel when they sinned or when they worshiped other gods or when they failed to give it, carry out their mission. This is good news because it tells us that God still offers mercy even when we're disobedient. Now Paul experienced this truth in his own life and he shared this good news with the Roman Christians in verse 32 where he writes, For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. I've learned a lot about mercy through being a parent. Now, Victoria and I have had those moments when our kids have tested us and done things they know they shouldn't have done. Punishments have varied, but we always use those moments to teach them about doing the right thing. And we always strive to respond with mercy because we want them to grow and learn from their mistakes. And when parents respond to disobedience with mercy, I think they do so because they're more interested in the future than the past, which, by the way, seems to be the way that God, the way God treats people in the Bible. Now, in the Scripture, we read about all kinds of sinners, but God consistently responds with mercy because the Lord wants to see growth and transformation in His people. Now, this is true even when we are at our worst, See, God doesn't give up on us. We may be acting in awful ways. We may not be doing the things God wants us to do. But God doesn't give up on His commitment to us. God keeps His promises. Now, if you turn back to Romans chapter 8, you'll read that God has promised to redeem all creation. And as Paul sees it, this redemptive work has expanded from Israel in such a way that it now includes the Gentiles. In other words, God is working to share mercy with all people. And that means we ought to be on the lookout for where God is at work and then join God by sharing the gift of mercy with others. And I think this is desperately needed right now because our world is in great need of mercy. It's in short supply. Years after President Calvin Coolidge died, a story came to light of his early days as president. Coolidge had been traveling around and he was staying at a hotel. One morning he was awakened by a cat burglar going through his belongings. Obviously this was a, a disconcerting situation, but the president remained calm and he started talking to the burglar. And he asked the burglar to not take his pack pocket watch because it contained a special engraved charm on it that he wanted to keep. Well, President Coolidge continued to talk with this thief, and he discovered that he was a college student who had no money to pay his own hotel bill or even buy a train ticket back to campus. The president felt sorry for this young man, and he ended up giving him $32 as a loan and then advised him to leave the same way that he entered the room so that the Secret Service agents wouldn't catch him. Now that's a remarkable act of mercy. You know, mercy is given when it's not deserved. That college student certainly didn't deserve what President Coolidge gave to him. The Israelites didn't deserve the gifts that God shared with them. And Paul didn't deserve the grace God showered on him. But God is gracious and merciful and his gifts are irrevocable. It's important that we not lose sight of this, especially in this moment, when so many good things have been taken away from us because of the COVID pandemic. 
Now, some of the good things that we typically enjoy in life are absent right now, but the gifts of God are irrevocable. So is the calling of God. Now, God doesn't take back the calling He has placed on His people. Now, we know that the church has been made by God to be a people on mission. And in writing uh, about the people of Israel, Paul posed the question, has God rejected his people? And then he answers his question by saying, by no means. Now, to fully appreciate what Paul is talking about, we need to review what was said in chapters 9 through 11. And in these chapters, Paul talks about how Israel had been disobedient, but their disobedience actually allowed God's mercy to move to more and more people. However, this is not an excuse to send more so that we can experience more of God's mercy. That's not the point Paul is trying to make. What Paul is saying is similar to some of the things that we read about in the Old Testament. If you read the Minor Prophets, you'll read of a time when God was disappointed with Israel because their worship and their justice left a lot to be desired. Now, you can find plenty of other places in the Bible where God is disappointed with His people. And usually this disappointment lies in the fact that Israel wasn't doing what it was called to do. See, they were created to be a blessing to others. Their mission was to help God's family grow by blessing other people. In fact, God calls the church to do the same. The Lord wants us to be on a mission of blessing others because it's part of who we are. But if we're not living as missional Christians, then we're deviating from God's plan. Earlier in our worship, we recognized the 75th anniversary of our church. From the very beginnings, mission has been a building block for us. We started as a mission to the neighborhoods right around this church building. We saw this as our mission field. We developed English as a second language courses. We started a preschool and an arts ministry. We started sending mission teams to places all around our country and to places far away like the Ukraine, Spain, China, South Africa, Haiti, Honduras, and most recently, the Bahamas. In our time together as a church, we've started and we've ended a variety of ministries, all in response to our mission, our calling, to love God, love people, and live the gospel. Continued faithfulness to this calling requires us to constantly clarify the direction of our church, to evaluate our priorities, and to reaffirm the fact that God is on a mission and invites our participation in that mission. Now, God has given us a calling for a reason, and God has given us gifts for a reason. We've been given these things so that we might carry out a small part of God's work right here on this earth. But when we ignore our gifts and our calling, we miss out on opportunities to see God's power at work, and that keeps us from growing into our full potential and becoming the people whom God has created us to be. And yet, even if we ignore what God is calling us to do, God will continue to invite us to be on mission. This is one of those things that we can always count on because God is not going to revoke it. And since the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, I think the best response we can make is like Paul's. If you turn over to chapter, one, chapter 12, verse 1, Paul writes, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, I hope each of us will respond to the irre irrevocable gifts and calling of God in this way. Let's use our gifts to spread the good news of Jesus Christ and to make life better for everyone. I invite you now to bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord, you have blessed us with many gifts 
and have placed a calling on each of us. We pray that you would guide us in sharing your gifts, especially your mercy with the world around us. After all, you've been merciful to us through Jesus Christ. And the least we can do is share that mercy with others. And Lord, we pray that all that we do will be an act of worship to you. We pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. I invite you to join with me now in celebrating communion, and I hope you have your communion supplies near you. But today we are 
remembering through the Lord's Supper all that God has done for us through Jesus Christ. We remember his life, death, resurrection, and the promise that he will come again. We also remember that night when Jesus gathered his disciples together for one final meal. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and a cup to teach his disciples more about himself and more about his love. And so as we take the time now to remember these things, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Oh God, we thank you for offering us the gift of your Son and the gift of mercy. We thank you that through Christ we have forgiveness and reconciliation with you. We thank you for the abundant life you have given us. And we pray that you will empower us to live in faithful ways that advance your kingdom in this world. It is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. While Jesus was at the table with his disciples, he took some bread, he blessed it, and then he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, and let us now do likewise. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup, and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. When you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And let us now do likewise. According to tradition, the disciples finished their meal by singing a song together. Let's follow their example and unite our voices now in song. Let us sing together. Would you pray with me, please? 
And now go in peace. And as you go, know this. By the grace of God, you were brought into this world. And by the mercy of God, you have been sustained to this very moment. And by the love of God, fully revealed in Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed now and forevermore. Amen.